everybody. Uh, welcome to our podcast series on the Cosmopolis. And uh, uh, as the name of our uh, channel suggests, uh, it was long overdue to actually have a playlist and a series of conversations dedicated to the idea of the, the Cosmopolis itself, which is Bangalore. And, uh, uh, you know, the many aspects uh, of its identity uh, that we want to explore by and by, you know, it's uh, things that are very local and yet global, uh, you know, uh, so it's so and it's very befit befitting that we have uh, Rupa Pai with us, uh, who has been, uh, whose life has been intertwined with this city in more ways than one and, uh, you know, and I, it's finally culminated in this book uh, on Bangalore's iconic uh, Kaban Park. Uh, the book is titled, as you can see, uh, uh, the Kaban Park, the green heart of Bangalore. And uh, I think uh, to just to introduce Rupa, uh, one of the great things about uh, her is uh, her versatile versatility in, uh, you know, sort of uh, exploring various genres. So it could be children's writing, uh, sort of popular science, uh, uh, and uh, now uh, a sort of a book which is a kind of an urban history, if I may uh, say so. And uh, uh, which is uh, sort of uh, reaffirms the uniqueness of uh, what Bangalore is in many ways uh, through this space which is uh, the Kaban Park uh, and uh, yeah so uh, we're glad to have you here and uh, anyway beyond that uh, I want to also mention how I came across uh, uh, Rupa with this wonderful documentary by Usha Rao called Lava Metropolis where uh, I saw, I spotted her giving one of her very well-known Bangalore walks, uh, which uh, was quite engaging and, you know, uh, she, apart from being a writer, she's quite a performer also as, uh, so she was, she had all her uh, guests uh, totally enraptured with her, uh, you know, narration about the history and, uh, you know, various aspects of Bangalore and so then I just followed up and realized that, uh, you know, she has so many things she has written and we're glad to have you here at Alliance University, uh, the School of Liberal Arts. Uh, so, you know, so I, I thought I'll begin right away with, uh, you know, the the motivation to uh, finally see that this park uh, could be a sort of, a, you know, a hinge through which uh, you could look at all other aspects about Bangalore as you do. So, I mean, uh, can you just talk about that, how that motivation came about? So. Sure. Uh, thank you so much for having me as uh, one of the guests on your Cosmopolis podcast, Ravi. And I'm delighted to be here at this beautiful university recording this podcast. Uh, about how I came upon the idea of what was the motivation to write this book, Carbon Park, The Green Heart of Bengaluru. So, as you have already mentioned, I'm uh, very much a Bangalorean and my life has been intertwined with the story of Bangalore itself in a way, but I only see it now looking back. I didn't think about that growing up, but uh, I'm a third generation Bangalorean. Uh, so this city has been home forever, but how much it has changed. Uh, when I was growing up here, it was a sleepy, beautiful pensioners paradise uh, that I was dying to get away from. I wanted adventure, I wanted to go to the big cities of, of India and the world. And uh, you know, friends of mine who, school friends, always used to go somewhere to their native place for uh, summer vacation and my native place was here. All grandparents lived here, all relatives lived here, everything. So I never got to go out on these. So this has been, oh, it was a cherished wish for me to go away from this city. And I did. The moment I was able to, I left. And uh, I got married very quickly and left the city, didn't come back for 12 years. Lived in Bombay, lived in Delhi, lived in uh, New York, lived in London, lived in Orlando, Florida. And then when I came back, I felt like, uh, okay, now I have earned my own space in the world. I have some identity of my own and now possibly it's okay to go back to Bangalore. Uh, I also had children by then and I wanted them to grow up in a place where their grandparents, where they could be in touch with their grandparents. And that was one of the things that motivated my husband and me to move back from the US. And I was expecting, I, I did not know what to expect, but I came back to a city that had completely transformed in my absence. I mean, of course, I used to visit on holidays, but not to, I didn't live here anymore. But when I came back to live, I realized that my city had grown up. It had become a global city. There were so many people from outside India, uh, from outside the state who had moved in here. 
the feel was different, texture was different. But I'm glad to say it's been almost 20 years since I moved back and I have I discover every day even in 2023 that Bangalore has retained its sort of small town village character. You know, I keep saying it's still a village because the like minded people you will run into them even though it has expanded so much it's n you cannot get away from people like yourself and mm. I think this is true for everyone. Whoever is here, whatever their interests are, whatever their affinities, they will find people like themselves. Uh, I think the only really uh, thing that defines Bangalore or mm, differentiates it from other cities, old cities, is that it is, it is very forward thinking, very liberal and very, as your podcast itself says, very cosmopolitan. It makes, it has the ability, the very unique ability to make everyone feel at home. So when my husband and I returned from the US, we, we wanted to do something about Bangalore. We had lived in a country that had so little history, but made so much of it. Uh, and we said, you know, we come from such an ancient culture and we don't have enough people talking about it, telling other people about it, celebrating it. Uh, and uh, when, we came back, when we came back, we thought we were going to talk about Humpy. We wanted to develop a tour around Humpy. And we tried it for a while, but our children were small. We were based here. Humpy was very far away. Even to go and develop the tour and for us to be away for uh, long periods of time leading these tours, it wasn't happening. Because like everyone else, we also thought Bangalore doesn't have much of a history. Because I think the Bangaloreans lament and problem, even to this day, is when guests visit from outside, where do you take them? What do you show them in Bangalore? There is no monuments, there's no palaces, there are no fancy forts. And so you end up taking them to Kaban Park and Lal Bagh. And then you come back home and say, what else? I say, let's hit the pubs. Because that is what uh, is Bangalore really. The, the, the freedom that women and families have to go into a pub or a microbrewery at any time and have a pint where children are running around, grandparents are sitting. It doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's that kind of a very liberal, that British character of Bangalore has remained. So we started Bangalore Walks and then, you know, 10, 12, 15 years of doing it. And in the meantime, I also became a children's writer in the same time frame after I came back. I used to write for children before, but this became a writing books for children after I moved back to Bangalore. And then I told myself that I used to always feel that I've written so many books and I've talked so much about Bangalore, but I haven't written a book on Bangalore. Somehow the two things haven't come together. And that opportunity came during COVID when uh, an editor friend of mine uh, from a publishing company called Speaking Tiger, they were putting together a bunch of, a series of neighborhood books where uh, they did deep dives into neighborhoods, not entire cities, but neighborhoods. So they already had uh, two books on Delhi out, one on Connaught Place and one on Chandni Chowk. They had two books on Bombay out, uh, Shivaji Park and uh, Kolaba, and maybe something on Tamil in Nepal. And then they said, uh, we're looking to write, do a book on the neighborhoods of Bangalore. And she told me, since you've been doing these walks for a long time and you're so passionate about your Bangalore, do you want to do me a book on a neighborhood in Bangalore? And of course, I jumped at the idea. I said, thank God, somebody is actually, I didn't have to go looking for an idea, a sense of looking for a commission or, look, or writing a book and then finding a publisher. Publishers come to me. This is excellent. And, uh, but then began the real trouble of what neighborhood do I write about? Uh, because I grew up in one part of Bangalore. I live in a different part of Bangalore. Um, and uh, but none of them are me so much because I only spent parts of my life here and parts of my life elsewhere uh, in Bangalore. And I've talked a lot about Bangalore, but about the central British cantonment part or the old city part, but they didn't they didn't move me in any particular way. Uh, and then I was like, so what neighborhood should I write about? What neighborhood do I feel deeply about? What neighborhood has sustained me and means equally the same to me as it did when I was a child. What is that one unchanging core of Bangalore that has sustained me throughout all my years here and away? And uh, while I was going through this uh, serious soul searching, my editor said, you know, she was so per perturbed that I was so perturbed. And she said, you know, it doesn't have to be like a conventional neighborhood. It doesn't have to be, for instance, Malishwaram, Indranagar, Rajajinagar. Not like that. It can even be 
a park maybe and she said do you want to write about lal bag and then the penny dropped and i said there are so many books about lal bag but i know exactly what i want to write about kaban park because i have been to kaban park as a child i have written that toy train i have such like every bangalorean of my generation i have these memories of riding that putani express train i have memories of eating popcorn and uh, cotton candy on weekends uh, it was such a, a strong uh, memories of coming to bal bhavan and watching a play or a film there coming for school competitions drawing competitions painting competitions sitting in bal bhavan in the park so many um, memories of that and later when i began to think about it i'm like i went to college my engineering college was uh, on the fringes of lal of kaban park the vishweshwaraya college of engineering uvc i was born in st martha's hospital which abuts kaban park i uh, i was actually wooed and romanced by my current husband in kaban park and uh, I, i came back from uh, my parents had a membership at the century club which is in kaban park so i was there a lot and uh, then i come back from wherever i've traveled the world with my children and i've introduced them and the first thing that came to me was i have to introduce them to kaban park when i came back and they have spent such so many lovely weekends picnics cycling uh, rollerblading whatever in the park and uh, after i got married i moved to indra nagar where my husband lives used to grew up and just moving between sheshadripuram kumara park and uh, indra nagar kumar park where i grew up and indra nagar where i now live meant that i had to pass kaban park all the time it was always on the way and i said i have all and now in the last 6 years i have a little I have, i have a dog for the first time in my life and kaban park is the only park that allows dogs so i find myself going back again to kaban park it has sustained me it has nurtured me it has nourished me uh and it has remained unchanging through all of it and i said wow this is i'm going to write about carbon park and then when i thought a little deeper about okay this is all your personal stuff why you want to write about carbon park but does it make sense to write about carbon park it does because when i think about the location of carbon park it is historically at the center of city and cantonment the really the history of bangalore is a tale of two cities and the two cities were divided and united by this space called carbon park so it felt like perfect that's the motivation a very long answer but <laughs> yeah no i mean uh, uh, that kind of uh, was very interesting for me uh, to come to terms with the fact that you know uh, in some sense it is a colonial legacy because yes. uh, and and you know right now there's this uh, we live in times when there's this uh, surge of anti colonial feelings mm-hmm. and uh, what i the get the yet the sense that i get is that uh, this colo- this was also a reason the spa- uh, the park was a reason for people of the city to come together yes. and find a cause that brings them together so mm-hmm. uh, you know so in in some sense it has uh, it probably didn't start like that from as you r- say that it was just meant to be for the relaxation of the british officers or you know just to serve as a lawn that yeah. you know uh, is sort of has ornamental purposes yes. at most yes. and uh, and yet i think what is very interesting is uh, when you st- later part of the books when you have all these uh, people of the city you know uh, who are coming out of the anonymity that otherwise bangalore forces on you mm. and you know th- whether they are protesting for you know yeah. against trees getting cut or uh, such things like that i think for me that was very interesting so can you talk like so you know we have this idea that uh, in indian cities there are very few public spaces in yes. any ways right yes, so yes that is true uh, so the whole idea of a public sphere in india and you know a park serving that yes uh, it sort of evolved into that kind of a space so can you talk about that process as you have captured it yeah i i i think that's like you said it started off as a colonial legacy it mm. was added by the chief engineer of mysore at that time his name was richard sankey uh and between 1831 and 1881 bangalore was and the kingdom of mysore was ruled directly by the british so and because the british cantonment was already based in bangalore bangalore became more central than mysore to the to whatever was happening under the british and uh, so they built this uh, uh, public offices new set of public offices uh, richard sankey was called the chief engineer he built this public uh, this set of public offices which is today the high court of karnataka also called the athara kacheri 
So he built this and like any uh, person from Britain or Ireland, he was like, you know, it. That there is no point for manor house unless it has a park around it. So he created, designed a 100 acre park, which he called Cabin Park after the erstwhile chief commissioner of Bangalore. Now, uh, so it was meant, as you said, it was meant to be an ornamental space, not, not like this forest it has become. And it continued like that for, so now 1870, the park was created. By 1947, when we got independence, Mysore had stopped being the center, it was Bangalore uh, and the two sides of Bangalore, the, what the location of Carbon Park is also such that it was placed directly at the junction of the old city administered by the Maharaja, it was called city and the British cantonment administered by the British. So until independence you actually had to pay a toll to come from one side to the other and mm. Carbon Park was the buffer zone. But once we got independence and the two sides were merged, Carbon Park suddenly became the space where the city people also felt they had a right over it and the cantonment people also felt they had a right over it, Ma, our park, our park. And therefore, it became a space where everyone could convene and talk and it, it, both sides were welcome and things like that. That's how it started. And then the Vidhan Sauda came up much later, 1956, that got finished. And what Kaban Park then became was the nucleus around which the four pillars of democracy swirled. There is the, the, the Atara Kachari, the old administrative offices, became the judiciary. The, the Vidhan Sauda became the, exe, uh, the executive judiciary. Not, what's the term? So there's a legislature. Legislature, sorry. Yeah, yeah so the Vidhan Sauda had the legislature. The judiciary was in the Atara Kachiri. The executive was further down the road. There was a uh, building, there's a boring building with a boring name. It's called multi storied building. That's where the executive sits. And the fourth estate of democracy, which is the press, uh, had their press club inside the park mm -hmm. and all their offices around it. So, this in most other cities, if you think about it, the cantonment is outside the city, mm. right? You, today, if you look at Pune cantonment is somewhere outside, Delhi cantonment is outside. Mm. But in Bangalore, very differently, the cantonment continues to be the center of the city. And this park became this. So in the center of the city, prime real estate, we have in Bangalore managed to still retain it as a 197 acre park. I think that is itself a very unique achievement. And the fact that somehow, even though the BDIs of all these power structures are always on Carbon Park and are trying to dismantle it, taking a little piece here, a little piece there for whatever private purposes, somehow the citizens of Bangalore have seen to it that it is retained. And this went into a, you know, in the 70s, they brought, up, they brought out a Parks Preservation Act because this was so much under threat always. So, a Parks Preservation Act, where, where the Vidhan Sauda stands now, the Vikas Sauda, all of it was also considered Kaban Park, part of the park, and it was a 300 acre space as recently as 1970 in the middle of town, where the powers that be decided nothing will be moved here, no building will be allowed, not a brick can be added or removed. You can only restore, repair what is already there, but we will not allow any building. So, that happened. Obviously, that kind of thing that was in that surge of nationalistic or whatever idealism would not last for too long. So by 1980, already there was a proposal to tear down the Athara Kacheri uh, and uh, saying that even, I, yeah, they were like, no, it's structurally, it is uh, fragile and, you know, it's already 110 years old and it's a British building and we should, you know, maybe set up something else. And who knows where that would have gone because they would have taken that part and then extended it into the park. Mm -hmm. You know, there would have been nothing to stop them. But then, for the first time in Bangalore, a group of concerned citizens, just four or five of them got together and said, we have to stop this, including the head of INTAC at the time. And they said, this is part of our heritage, we can't have it. And a team of architects volunteered, structural engineers, to go and see, is it really structurally unstable? Does it really? Because if that is so, then obviously it makes sense to pull it down. And they went in and they discovered it was not. And then they filed for the very first time a public interest litigation, a PIL, against the sitting government, uh, against the demolition of what is considered heritage. And that plea was heard in the building that was marked for demolition, the High Court itself. 
and the citizens won. So that PIL worked and the uh, building was not pulled down, 1980, so it's already 43 years since then and the building is still standing, still glorious and annex has been built, etc. But what it did was that it sounded, uh, it empowered the citizens of Bangalore to know that if they felt really strongly about a piece of heritage or trees or you know that, that the government was interfering with anything, they could come together as a body and stop this from happening. And for some reason, Carbon Park became sort of a symbol of all of that, of all the things that could go wrong because of greed, because of um, powerful people exercising their uh, veto on things. And so Carbon Park became a place of protest, of rallies. And uh, and the park itself became something to protect. It's like Jantar Mantar. Yeah. It's of that purpose that, also. Yeah, but here it was, the thing is, it was not a historic building. There's nothing there. It's just mm. the... the the DNA of Bangalore is that if you're pulling down some old structure, people won't care so much. But if you're cutting down a tree, something happens to Bangaloreans. They all just come together. And the park is a green cathedral. It's full of trees. So anything yeah. to do with the park becomes a matter of interest and emotional interest to all Bangaloreans. So, and the good part is that it takes so many different forms. Now people have reclaimed it in so many ways. People, like you said, immigrants who have come into the city, for them, any anybody, they, you know, I have spoken to a runner in the book, and he says, it forces itself into your orbit, Carbon Park. You can't escape it. If you say, what should I see in Bangalore? One of the first names that will come up is go to Carbon Park. And uh, if you say, where can I run? They'll say Carbon Park. If you say, where can I take a picnic? Where do I take the kids? Whatever it is, where do I go see the flowers? That's the other thing now. So go to Carbon Park. So it has become a place that, uh, and immigrants are feeling for it, taking over it, uh, you know, saying that we need to also protest. We need that feeling of this is my Bangalore, this is my city, somehow reaches some fever pitch once you go to Carbon Park. When you see this glorious forest that exists in the middle of the city, you feel like, so I need to protect this. This is what is very unusual about this city. So I think it has, uh, I mean, it, both sides have benefited. Carbon Park has benefited from the uh, citizens and citizens have benefited from the park. So it's a very give and take kind of relationship. And, uh, and there are so many agendas, so many pushes and pulls that it keeps Carbon Park stable, I think. Mm -hmm. Because there's a Walkers Association which says that, oh, we don't want dogs in the park. And uh, there are the Dog Lovers Association, which says we, we do want dogs in the park and we'll fight for it. Then the runners will say that, uh, you know, we want mud paths, please don't concrete the paths or don't, because, you know, for running. And then the older senior citizen group will say, but we need paths and we need benches, otherwise how will we enjoy the park? It's so, a site for a social experiment. <laughs> well, totally. And it's, it's a like microcosm of Bangalore itself. Micro, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything comes in there. Yeah. And the best part is it's such a expansive, generous space that also reflects the expansive, generous, liberal nature of Bangaloreans itself. So let me let me uh, hold that uh, hold you on that because what when you you, you actually say this uh, was it the intrinsically liberal nature of the native uh, Kanadigas that imbued the park with its large heartedness or is it that belligerents of every stripe lost their ire within the confines of this green cathedral. So, I mean, uh, uh, w what would your position be? Like, I mean, if what, now mm, that you had to... Because, I think a because bit of both, a bit of both for sure. But, you know, I know that this notion of Kanadigas being peaceful, uh, kind of laid back people is constantly being challenged. Um, yeah, but you know, uh, because uh, just to, I'm um, yeah, sorry yeah. to cut you there, but yeah. no. uh, because uh, you know, you spoke of Maleshwaram. Mm -mm. Now, I mean, that's a site that I am quite fascinated by in yeah. my own way because they have this idea that, okay, this is what uh, R.K. Narayan was inspired mm. by and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And definitely, R.K. Narayan's novels are the epitome of the laid back small town. Yes. You know, yes. where uh, very ugly things don't happen. Yeah. People tied over things. So, you know, so is that an ethos that you are saying that is the root of the liberalism of the Kanadiga so liberalism or something I like that? I think there are many factors to it. One is that um, I think the this is when we talk about Bangalore, we are talking about an ethos that is also 
Ma- old Mysore because it mm. is part of the Mysore kingdom. Mm. And uh, the Mysore kings, after see, we had a period where uh, Hyder Ali and Tipu Sultan had taken over mm. the, from the warriors because there were some incompetent kings at the time. So, it was there was a power vacuum. Hyder Ali filled it rather well in the sense that he was able to fob off the British, he and his son for quite a long time. And once that, once Tipu Sultan died in 1799, there was no further resistance to the rise of the British in South India. So, they held it off for a while. So, after 1799, the Vodiyats came back into power. But during that transfer of power, it became sort of like a subsidiary alliance uh, where there was a British resident in the court of the king. So, it was a collaborative kind of effort. And 18, but again, that that sort of broke down between 1831 and 1881 when the Maharaja was sort of fired, uh, and uh, these the British took over directly. But by 1881, many things had happened. It was no longer the East India Company; it was the Crown, uh, and Mysore had uh, always been sort of an exemplary state in terms of not resisting the British too much, going along with the flow kind of thing. So. The queen herself approved of uh, of the next heir to the throne, who the Mysore Maharaja Krishna Raja Bodhi the third. He had adopted his grandson, and the queen approved of it. And the, from 1881, 1818 was the rendition when it went back to the Mysore kings. When the Chamaraja Bodhi the tenth attained the age of maturity, he became 18, and the kingdom re- reverted to the Maharajas. Of course, they would still be a resident in the court, a British resident, but it became the, a princely state again. So, these three, the three kings who came after rendition, that was Chamaraja Bodhir the 10th, his son Krishna Raja Bodhir the 4th, uh, Krishna Raja Bodhir, and his nephew uh, Jaya Chamaraja Indra Bodhir, who was the last king of Mysore. These were amazingly liberal men. Mm. Uh, they were able to contain within themselves a wonderful mix of East and West. While mm. they were very proud of their origins, they composed in Sanskrit, they were masters of uh, many Indian musical instruments and uh, they were scholars in Sanskrit and all that. They also were able to celebrate whatever was best in the West and bring it. And somehow that percolated down to the rest of their uh, people. And, That's, yeah. and Mysore and Bangalore became a place where you know, the British uh, kind of culture and the uh, Kanadiga kind of culture could coexist quite happily. Yeah. Which yeah. was again a unique thing. Yeah. B- in fact, there's this instance where you talk about this British of, of officer uh, 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 ensuring that there is a day for the woman to go to the yes. museum, yeah. right? So yeah. that kind of thing yes. is sort of been enabled by the, yeah. you know, the ruling subject. So, it's, yes. it's sort of uh, flowing down from the top totally, to some totally, extent. Totally, totally, actually quite a lot flowing down from the top and somehow I don't know. And right now it's coming from the bottom so yeah. to speak if yes, you like yes. because the citizens are, citizens coming, are together. coming together. Yeah. yeah. It was the liberal attitude of the Maharajas as individuals uh, you know who were sort of open to absorbing things from the west uh, who sort of uh, in, even collaborated with the yeah. Britishers in that sense. Uh, which which was an attitude that percolated uh, downwards and you know so this is what you call the native Kannadiga liberal spirit yeah right and which actually if we can even take it further back by 800 years mm. to the bhakti movement in North Karnataka <laughs> yeah that would be fun yeah yeah I, I guess yeah, yeah. because uh, Vasava uh, who created who was the sort of uh, what do you say founder of the yeah. Lingayat uh, sect or whatever you want to Call them the and that is the reason, uh, by the way, I- in, uh, he's now brought back into the conversation because this whole mother of democracy yeah. uh, thing yes. that is now, you know, being uh, talked, talked about with your G- G20. Yes, uh, yes. And, you know, uh, he's being hailed as one of the original icons of democracy. Absolutely, you know, Eastern absolutely. Icons, so, yeah. uh, democracy and anti-casteism and yeah. all those liberal ideas have flowed through Karnataka forever. And if you go even beyond Basava hmm. to the Hoysalas hmm. when uh, Veera Balala the second was the emperor and uh, uh, Ramanuja came fleeing from uh, Chola, uh, the Shaivite Chola empire because of persecution. He was here and uh, he was welcomed and the Belur Halebi temples are such a um, 
especially the ones in Halebid, they were built by the Jain minister, uh, the, the Shaivite minister of Virabalala who had become Vaishnavite and his queen Shantala was Jain. So this kind of harmonious living together of different religions has been there forever of accepting people from the outside, imbibing the best of their cultures. Uh, so it's a tradition in yeah. uh, in Karnataka in general and it, I think it came to fruition also once again in Bangalore and Mysore, in the old Mysore kingdom mm. through these three kings. So that is why we are able to live very comfortably with the statue of Queen Victoria mm. lording it over a street named after the father of the nation. Yeah. <laughs> you know, MG Road, uh, Mahatma Gandhi is also there but that kind of the ability to take in the best of East and West synthesize it into something entirely new and purely Bangalore, uniquely Bangalore. It has been there uh, all through many, many centuries and also the uh, ability to ability to do that and the comfort we have living with this happened in the past and that's fine. That was our past. We don't need to destroy it. Uh, and if you destroy it, it doesn't really make the past go away. What happened did happen. So might as well we use that as a launch pad for to go forward and learn some lessons from it kind of thing. So yeah, I think Kavan Park yeah. exemplifies that also. Yeah. In fact, that kind of leads me to one of my last questions, which is, uh, you know, much as we were talking about the idea of democracy having uh, its own Indian antecedents in mm. Basava. Mm. Similarly, one of the things that I'm quite uh, curious about, because I'm not sure how much work has been done on that is the idea of a city. Mm. Because then we often say that the city is also a Western concept, yeah. right? And uh, yet, uh, very clearly, uh, you know, uh, there is a sense of what it means to be urban in the Indian imagination as well. And actually, the Britishers, you know, when they first came, came, they actually used those words, as you say, the word peta, yeah. you know, which yeah. then becomes corrupted by the British yeah. and they then yeah. use it for certain Indian localities. Uh, so, and then uh, you have a new imagination of the city because of the corporate, you know, gated communities and yeah. malls and stuff, which is again yeah. another wave, so to speak. Yes. So, I mean, what what is your view on these competing ideas of a city? Because I think in some sense, a city is cosmopolitan by definition, yeah. wherever it is. Yeah. Right. So, uh, then, uh, you know, what what are these different imaginations coming into play? Yeah, so it's always going to be like that. There's always going to be different imaginations and it's all and particularly in a place like Bangalore, which is open to change, new and uh, different imaginations will keep overlaying the older ones and mm. all of them will actually have to coexist in real time mm. because somebody's imagination of what Bangalore city means even right now is different from what somebody else thinks of Bangalore as. Mm. Uh, and interestingly, now that you mentioned that, what is happening now in the mythic society, for instance, uh, they are on a huge project led by a software engineer, of course, this is Bangalore, it has to be a software engineer who has given up his uh, job and taken a three-year sabbatical to do what? Uh, it's a very lovely, interesting project. He is digitizing the inscription stones of Bangalore. Mm -hmm. Okay, And the inscription stones hold so much of the history of Bangalore. And they did to what time? Like to data to what time yeah. so this is let me tell you a little bit more about that so we the story of the founding of bengaluru yeah the most popular story the official story is that it began in 1537 and was founded by kempe mm. and to an extent that is true that fort town of bengaluru which is the pete or the peta uh, that that is dated to 1537 for sure but the inscriptions and there is another very um, um, apocryphal story of the founding of Bangalore, a legend which dates back to the Hoysala time which is 11th century or so, uh, 11th, 12th century, which 11th century I would say, which is about Veera Balala II who I already mentioned in a different context, who apparently was on a hunting trip and he lost his way in the forest, he was chasing after a stag, he, he got separated from his retinue, uh, began, night began to fall, the wolves howls and the tiger's roars were getting too too much, he was looking for a place to stay, a safe space, he needed something to eat and he saw a cooking, f he saw a fire in a distance and said, if there is a fire, there is human habitation, I will ride towards that. He rode towards it, found that it was the cooking fire of a little old woman who was making herself a very frugal meal of boiled beans. 
but the king was so desperately hungry and used to being a king so he said like can i please have something to eat even though he knew that that's all there was and the old woman without a clue as to who this person was because in those days they never knew what their king looked like uh, she generously gave him more than half her frugal meal and said please eat and you sleep and the next morning when his retinue found him and he and the old woman realized he was the king and was a little overwhelmed uh hey virabalala is supposedly uh, supposed to have said that you know i can't just go away without doing something appropriately kingly so what can i do uh, so he said in the in honor of the generosity of this little old woman this town shall henceforth henceforth be called the town of boiled beans bend the karl uru which went through many iterations and became bengaluru so the story of the naming of bengaluru goes back to 11th century even though the official town started in 1537 now what these inscription stones have done again it was a british person called b l rice benjamin lewis rice who for to all intents and purposes he was british but i mean to by birth he was british but to all intents and purposes he was bangalorean he's called the billy kanadiga the white kanadiga his father was a pastor he came here in the 19th century this boy this man grew up here became inspector of schools uh, started to wander around karnataka on his inspection tours was fascinated by these epigraphical evidence documentation on stones of the history of, he didn't know what they were but things were written on stones and he began to collect them document them get them translated and put them in in the end he he managed to document more than 8000 inscriptions uh stone inscriptions and put them in 12 volumes of a book called epigraphia karnataka and more recently 3 4 years ago this gentleman called uday kumar he said uh you know he was just just as a curiosity he's he's wanted to cycle he was part of a cycling group he said where shall we cycle let's go and see where if bl rises the 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 stones that he had located in bangalore are they still there that became a project he began to cycle around and try to locate these stones and discovered to his horror that many were missing others were in poor states of repair nobody knew what they meant or that they were worthy of reverence they were in gutters culverts they had used as paving used as paving stones so he went to the mythic society with this proposal that you know a lot of heritage is being lost and i can help you and he says the archaeological department is so poorly funded and within that funding they have to take care of hampi and some inscription stone in bangalore which is difficult so he said let's get some other people involved and the mythic society supported him now it's a three year project he has been digitizing and uh, in uh, bl rice had discovered an inscription stone in begur in a temple in begur which is near the silk board today's infamous silk board uh, discovered an inscription that's that the first for that mentioned a town called bengaluru and that inscription dates back to the 9th century so again the history of bangalore was pushed back now our uh, uday kumar and team discovered an inscription that is not in epigraphia karnataka they discovered it themselves in hebbal about a hero called kittaya these stones usually were called veeragallus they they commemorated a heroic victory or the last stand of some hero in a war and this was about a hero called kittaya and the word the name of hebbal was mentioned it was called peragola or something that was a different but what what used to be hebbal and that dated to the 7th century so they said at least hebbal was around in the 7th century if not bengaluru at least one settlement was there and uh, but there is also a copper plate inscription which mentions the word begur uh, at a settlement called begur which dates from the 5th century ce 6th century 517 ce so for all its modernity and its western outlook and all that bengaluru is actually a very very old settlement it's 1500 years old uh what was your question what was i trying to answer i forgot oh, I, i think it uh, does answer my yeah, question yeah. i mean the fact that i mean the uh, there have been of bangalore has been uh, you know dwelt upon by so many so people so many people in and, so you know, many and as you ways. say maybe we can settle upon the idea that uh, this idea of bangalore is when all these coexist coexist right? yes, so, yes, yes, yeah, yes so yes yes yeah and thing. and so many layers that yeah. we are not aware of yeah. uh Yeah I think the only constant is change it will keep changing and there's no I don't think it's wise to resist as long as that spirit remains that feeling of ownership that this is our city whoever takes on that ownership 
it's okay. Yeah, and I think that probably I'll just wrap my uh, our conversation with this that uh, apart from a park, hmm. uh, the other public space that uh, cities have to themselves in some sense are universities. Yeah, and uh, you know we are a university and. That's also very interesting that we are located at the periphery rather than the center. Yeah. And yeah. I think uh, Bangalore is today no less about uh, the outskirts no, uh, no. as it is about common parks. And it so has always been about education and yeah, universities. Yeah, yeah. So, so what? So you know, so of, as somebody who is from the center of Bangalore, how do you look at uh, a sort of a peripheral contribution? Like oh. ours, what is what is well, your view? Well, so. uh, you know, in my book on Cabin Park, in the last chapter, we have a huge uh, builder, like a very very important real estate person in Bangalore, Irfan Razak, uh, the owner of the, the head of the Prestige Group. He says that you know, one Cabin Park is never going to be enough for Bangalore. People mm -hmm. should just stop messing with this Cabin Park and create new ones, yeah. so that uh, once again the spirit of Bangalore is ignited. Once again, there are green spaces. And this is my first visit to Alliance University and I have to say from the moment I have entered, I have just been overwhelmed by the beauty of the and the lushness of the vegetation here. I think you've done such a great job. I think this is an alternative carbon park already, a smaller but very necessary one. The amount of bird life you have, the flowers you have, it is very representative of Bangalore itself. Yeah. And to, you know, the, the mo much of the vegetation in Bangalore. Uh, we are built on a series of granite hills. Only the valleys exactly. were lush. It's an artificial. It's an artificially vegetation. created vegetation. Yeah. From the kings have planted it. The British people are the German horticulturist called Gustav Krumbiegel. He has done a lot of the landscaping of the city's avenues. So there's been a lot of international contribution to making Bangalore what it is. And looking at all the exotics that are here and the native uh, plants that live so harmoniously in the campus of Alliance. University, I would say this is a microcosm of Bangalore itself and may you live long and prosper and may more universities do this on their campuses. Yeah. Like create, apart from the buildings, apart from this chrome and glass or whatever, you know, that they also create green spaces because that is truly the DNA of Bangalore. If we can duplicate yeah. this uh, everywhere in every university, I think we are good for the future. Thanks a lot for those uh, kind words and uh, we do look forward to, we anyway envision, uh, uh, you know, converting our university into a hub of art and culture. But as you say, we also, it's a hub of art, culture and greenery, so yes. to speak. So yes. we'll, uh, we'll continue doing that and it's uh, great with you. We begin this series of conversations. We hope to have you back. As you know, we have barely scratched the surface. Uh, I mean, if you can dig up to a fifth century, then, you know, this is just the beginning. So uh, thanks again for coming and, uh, you know, having this conversation. Thank you so much, Ravi. I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you yeah. for having me.